talk about my experience with services. It begins in 1995, which was the last year of my undergraduate studies at the University of Oregon. And I experienced a profound sense of uncertainty about what to do next, which I think plagues a lot of university graduates. And so out of curiosity, I visited an information meeting on the US Peace Corps. I tried to learn about what was called the toughest job you'll ever love. And I realized that my coursework in applied linguistics qualified me to t work as an English teacher. I applied and was told that I'd be working in Russia. And I was thinking, of course, of Moscow, St. Petersburg, began to study Russian language and culture. And upon graduation, what I was told was, oh, you'll be working in the Russian Far East in a little village called Gorin. And that's about 8,000 kilometers east of Moscow, actually much closer to Beijing and Japan than to any other city in Siberia. So my understanding of the three years I spent in the Peace Corps has evolved over the years as I have come to understand the true value of the, the service I gave and how much was given to me, but as much as anything, how much I learned. I decided to present today at TEDx because I think that in a time when I see people gravitating to extremes, nations with long traditions of democracy moving towards polarized, entrenched uh, encampments where political debate looks sometimes more like tone-deaf shouting matches, what I learned from my Peace Corps service has become more valuable uh, than ever. So it really began as we flew from the United States to Russia for our intensive language and culture training program. And our first stop was this little town called Magadan on the Sea of Okhotsk. And it was a, a really bleak place. And I had read already that this was sort of the gateway to Stalin's gulag camps. After refueling, we flew on to the port city of Vladivostok, a city that had been closed to all foreigners because of its strategic value for the Russian Navy. And it had often been used to keep political dissidents in internal exile. We toured the city, and we walked past some of these monolithic government buildings still adorned with the symbols of what was now a vanished mighty Soviet empire. We walked past old decaying apartment blocks, which I thought were the ugliest dwellings I'd ever seen. But on returning home three years later, I could not immediately remember why I had even taken this photo. Shortly after this, we moved to Ussurisk to live with a host family and learn Russian at the local pedagogical institute. The family Skripnikovich gave me the room of one of their children, and I was mildly surprised that even the bedroom doors had glass windows in them, part of the heritage of the Soviet society that thought to shrink the private space of individuals, but covered with some form of plastic or paper to win that privacy back. Electricity and water were only available in the mornings and evenings, sometimes. I rode with them, five of us, in their Soviet-era car, a Moskvich, which had a top speed of maybe 80 kilometers per hour. We rode to their dacha, or a garden, where they went to relax, but also to grow food necessary for getting through long, harsh winters during a time when the government employees were not being paid for months at a time, and laborers were being paid in goods which they had to barter. From Usurisk, after a month of training, I moved northwards to my work station, going through Habarovsk, where I remember visiting this memorial to the Velika Atechkzvene Vaina, where the, the great patriotic fatherland war. It was at this point I realized that every mid-sized city I had visited in Russia had such a memorial, usually with hundreds, if not thousands, of names written on them from just that city alone something that my reading in history had not fully prepared me for. From here, it was a train and a bus ride to my teaching site, school number five in Gorin, a village off of a dirt road on the strategic Baikal Amur rail line connecting the east to the west with a few apartment blocks, but mostly wooden structures without houses. Two hours of dirt road to the nearest city of Komsomolsk, named after the idealistic communist youth party that had worked to spread communist ideology, I was told that my role as a Peace Corps volunteer would be understood by much of the population in the same light, but a different ideology. I was the first American to ever visit this village, and the first American that many of these people had ever seen. 
As I walked the streets, people would call me America as if it was my first name. And children would stand outside my apartment window, looking into it as I closed the drapes in the evenings. I wondered what people who had experienced decades of propaganda thought of me and was uncertain about the range of responses from those who wanted to talk to those who just stared or some who glared. At school number five, I taught mostly fifth graders English from a textbook called Happy English. Being reminded by my Russian teaching partner on a regular basis that happy was not a word Russians would understand. What I quickly learned is that while I could teach these children English, I did not have the survival skills necessary to make it in the Russian village in the Far East. No supermarkets, no convenience stores, no fast food joints for a quick snack, no service sector, just friends and family. Even when I was paid my monthly stipend, which I was embarrassed to learn was more than that of my principal, there was nothing to buy without taking a bus on that dirt road two hours out and two hours back. I wondered how I would make it for two years. And then I began to learn from the people I worked with that many had not been paid in three or four months. The adage, if you don't work, you don't eat, was not some aphorism of the president capitalist ethic any longer, but a harsh reality. If you weren't growing or hunting your own food in the villages, you were probably hungry. I became friends with my school principal, Vladimir Mikhailovich, and his wife, Valentina. And with their friends, I began the process of learning how to survive in a Russian village, poaching salmon, spearing psalm, helping to care for and slaughter the pigs, working in the fields to plant and harvest potatoes, and learning that if you couldn't make it or fix it yourself, or had a friend who could, you went without. If you didn't cut your own wood for heating, you would be cold. Well, I worked with them. After school and on the weekends, I began to learn their stories and their games. I taught Valentina cribbage, and Vladimir taught me to play Duraka or Fool. Vladimir was and remained a devout communist, opposed to the economic shock treatment imposed on Russia. Valentina was from a Jewish family whose father was a brilliant photographer who lived in the Jewish enclave in Birebujan, who had spent most of his life being persecuted by the Soviet authorities. Nina on the far right, my Russian teacher in the village, was a brilliant literature instructor who had never been able to progress professionally because she refused to become a communist. I also began to learn the true generosity of the people I came to serve as a volunteer. On my fourth Thursday of November in Russia, I was called over to my friend's apartment where they had managed to put together a surprise Thanksgiving dinner, as real as was possible, learning about it from questions they'd been asking me and I, as I tried to explain to them about stuffed turkey and American pie. Over the course of the next two years, my Russian got good enough to talk about culture, history, politics, and I learned that so many of my views were narrow and limited, unable to encompass the experience and knowledge of my friends, that what I had assumed to be assumed could not be. We shared the banya, rolled in the snow. We ice fished for fun more than for food. In hindsight, well, I went to serve in Goran as a Peace Corps volunteer and did teach the children English, opportunities for them. I learned and received far more than I could have ever given. It was not always so idyllic, though. This is where I almost lost my toes to frostbite. And there were those who did not miss a chance to tell me that Americans were not wanted in Russia. And an old woman veteran with medals on her chest who I had been told survived Stalingrad who on Victory Day told me with anger in her eyes that Americans had no right to steal their victory over Nazi Germany, but who later praised me kindly for being good at digging potatoes. I, I tell this story because it has become increasingly important to me. As I look around the world today, especially in my own country, I see people tightening the knots of exclusion and cultural egotism, walling themselves off into ideological camps that only read what they already believe turning those they disagree with into evil caricatures. I wonder if the most important lesson I learned from my service was not in what was given or received in far greater measure, but that service was the vehicle for bridging that massive cultural gap between a naive college graduate and people in a small isolated village in the Russian Far East. We met with what might have been considered 
unsurmountable cultural differences, subjected to decades of Cold War propaganda, shackled by illusions of others that had been created to define ourselves. Through an act of service, we humanized each other, valued each other, and in some cases began to see the world through each other's eyes. I've concluded that perhaps the only way out of our current culture malaise in the US and in other places is to take up that mantle of service, not much, so much to help others because we really aren't good at solving other people's problems, but simply to see the humanity of those we fear or demonize or don't understand, to learn to understand them, to bridge our own cultural divides. So as my students who might be in this audience, as you, as you participate in caste service, I hope that you embrace these service opportunities, that as you visit the, or the orphanages and the old folks' homes and participate in Habit for Humanity and raise funds for cancer victims and cancer survivors, I hope that you understand it's the transformative power of, of the service that goes beyond what you're actually giving. And I, I hope that if you're not in the DP yet, that you'll start to find service opportunities now because I think it is through service that we actually come to understand others more than we actually help them. Thank you.